一样。Okay. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to all of you. It's wonderful. I don't see you, but I know that you are with us, and、uh, we are very happy to have a second presentation by、um, Dr. Janet Silverman.、Uh, you've heard me many times, I'm sure, but I do have to introduce myself. So I'm Kavatiro Samuelson. I'm the director. Of the Center for Jewish Studies at Arizona State University, I'm also Irving and Miriam Lowe Professor of Modern Judaism and a Regents Professor of History. And you all know that Jewish Studies at、uh, ASU offers undergraduate and graduate courses, as well as a very robust program of public lectures. And you've been part of that. Uh, activity, our public activities.、Uh, I think for the especially for the last、uh, two and a half years since、uh, the COVID pandemic started. So at uh, uh, at Arizona State, we teach、uh, Jewish studies in a、yeah, kind of a civilizational approach. We pay attention to history, religion, and culture. We do so from a variety of disciplinary perspectives. So we bring into consideration history and sociology. Religious studies, philosophy, comparative literature, and the arts, and we've had a very robust, really wonderful、uh, semester that is now coming、uh, to an end. We had a lecture series on、um, Holocaust research from Poland. We had another lecture series on Christianity in historical perspectives. Uh, and then we had a very large,、uh, beautiful conference. I hope that some of you have attended the conference we did on November six on Jews in Italian musical life from fourteen fifty to the present.、Um, and we also have individual lectures.、Um, the first we had a, a person who received the Baron dissertation award. Her name was Ayelet Brin, and she gave a terrific lecture on gender. Uh, mass culture and American Yiddish press, and that was、uh, she was the recipient of the Baron dissertation award, and we honored her.、Um, we also are going to honor another person who participated in the Baron dissertation award on Sunday at six. That's、uh, Dr. Aaron Welt, and I'll mention that at the end of the talk again. So tonight we go back to issues of Jewish genealogy. With、uh, Dr. Janet Silverman, who has taught for us several times already before in 2020 and in 2021 and this year, and、uh, many of you know her. She's a professional genealogist. She's an editor. She's an educator. She has a PhD in Jewish studies from Spurtus Institute in Chicago, and her dissertation was titled "In Living Memory." So she is really committed to the. In a sense, the recovery and the preservation and the excavation of the life of、uh, hundreds of thousands of Jews who lived in this world, and unfortunately, of course, had to、uh, deal with the problems that Jewish existence is all about. So,、um, as a senior genealogist in、uh, Ancestry Pro Genealogies Company, she has a, her own research、uh, group. Our research team. She specializes in Eastern Europe and in Jewish research, and her work involves a lot of travel. That's of course before COVID. Now it's less so,、uh, but she's really on top of what's going on in the field of Jewish genealogy. So last week we heard her explain how to use the various databases in order to launch genealogical research. Tonight we are going to spend time in a more historical kind of、uh, presentation that is going to focus on refugees after World War II. So the main title that you see on the screen is "In the Aftermath." The subtitle is "Searching for Refugees After World War II." So, Janet, I'm going to give you、uh, the screen. I'm going to turn off my camera and my audio, and we're all going to listen to you. Thank you so much, Chava. It's a pleasure to be here with you guys again.、Um, I look forward to a day when we can perhaps、um, meet in person as well as、um, virtually do something hybrid. But this is not the time, at least for me, to do that. As Chava said, I am a research team manager at Ancestry Pro Genealogists, the division of Ancestry.com that does private client research. 
Uh, we use resources at Ancestry as well as elsewhere. And um, there'll be a handout that'll be sent out to you that has links to various uh, databases and repositories, including uh, the catalog listings of the Ancestry databases about the Shoah, about the Holocaust. And those are all free to access you. If you don't have an active Ancestry subscription, you will need a guest account to access those, but they are free to, to use. Please keep in mind that in order to do justice to the topic that we're discussing tonight, we would really need weeks or months of study. By necessity though, this talk really just touches superficially on many aspects of this important subject and the research behind it. When World War II ended, it didn't just abruptly end. On September 2nd, 1945, President Truman announced the end of the war with Japan. All over Europe, Axis troops had been surrendering in the months prior to that. VE Day, Victory Europe, Day was celebrated several months earlier on May 8, 1945, but the declaration regarding the defeat of Germany and the assumption of supreme authority by Allied powers wasn't signed by the four allies until a month after VE Day on June 5th. But the war didn't end with treaties for millions of people. Beginning with the liberation by the Soviet Army of Majdanek in the summer of 1944, other concentration camps continued to be liberated until May of 1945. Those in the camps were ill and homeless. They were in desperate need of physical and psychological medical care. The allied powers who needed to develop procedures of governance for hostile Axis territories also needed to establish ways to care for those survivors from the camps. In addition to the challenges of establishing safe harbors for the, these traumatized people, there was also hostility from the Russians directed at her former allies, which impeded successful closure. An even bigger challenge, however, was the way the Allied nations viewed responsibility for the refugees and survivors. Keep in mind that exclusionary practices were the norm of US immigration policies. The Johnson Reed Act passed on May 26, 1924, drastically limited the number of immigrants and assigned those permitted to be admitted by country of origin, heavily weighed in favor of white Protestants. Potential immigrants now would have to obtain a visa to come to America. There was no exception for refugees. There was no explicit quota for Jews, but there were minuscule quotas that allowed people from Eastern Europe, where most Jews lived, to be admitted to the US. The passage of the bill was reflective of the country's mood, and Hitler praised the passage of the bill. Even today, so many decades later, there are still issues with reparations and restitution. We frequently read reports dealing with the refusal to return artwork and other possessions to families with legitimate claims of possessions forcibly taken during World War II. Survivors of the camps were not the only people who were refugees. Others all over Europe had been displaced from their homes by armies taking over homes, land, and food. Homes all over Europe were destroyed and farms and woodlands were devastated by hordes of armies marching across the land. Tanks destroying the land they rolled across and bombs dropping, leaving craters and destruction behind. After World War II, refugees all over Europe lived in displaced persons camps, sometimes for years. Some who wanted to leave Europe were permitted to relocate. We'll discuss how to find information about refugees arriving in the US and track them into records to find out what happened to them during the war. Some of the documentation will reveal their parents' names and birthplaces. We're going to use one specific family's experience for the most in-depth look at research. Now, why do I think it necessary as part of finding information about the refugees to identify their parents, other relatives, birthplaces, and more? 
Although many of the refugees established themselves in their new homes, finding employment, becoming active in their communities, and raising families, that wasn't the sum total of their lives. All of us have histories. Without some knowledge of our family's history, we might feel di disconnected. Everyone, everything, and every place has some history. The majority of the survivors of the concentration camps, prisoners of war, enslaved laborers, na Nazi collaborators, and political prisoners were repatriated by, their ally by the Allies to their home countries. Some who were unwilling or unable to return to their home countries were helped to settle elsewhere. By January of 1945, a hundred assembly centers were established in France, Luxembourg, Belgium, and the Netherlands that housed and fed 247,000 people. It's estimated that over 7 million civilians were on the move in Western Europe by early summer 1945. In the Soviet controlled sectors, there were another 7 million, around 95,000 in Italy and over 140,000 in Norway. That doesn't take into account the imprisoned 7.8 million German soldiers held by Western allies and 2 million more held in the Soviet Union. I mention these vast numbers only to give you a mental picture of the turmoil that existed. Recently, during the Russian attacks on Ukraine, we saw millions of refugees fleeing their homes in Ukraine to nearby countries. And we read about the efforts to provide food, transportation, housing, jobs, and schooling for those refugees and the challenges faced as countries banded together to attempt to provide assistance. And of course, this is ongoing. Now, by late 1945, there were still over a million people who were lacking homes. Of these, more than 250,000, a quarter of the total were Jews. They lived in displaced persons camps, GP camps, in Germany, Austria, and Italy. Not too long ago, I read an article in the Smithsonian Magazine that spoke of the days immediately following the liberation of the camps and a space set up at what was the Hotel Lutetia in Paris, where between April and August 1945, survivors were housed. The article spoke about refugees arriving in Paris on trains and people lining the platform searching for family members, holding photos up and running up to people leaving the trains, asking if they knew their families. Trucks and buses and people on foot kept coming up to the hotel, like an endless caravan depositing deportees in front of the Grand Hotel. 800 arrived on April 29th and 30th, 1945, followed by 300 a day in May and 500 a day from the end of May until early June, until between 18,000 and 20,000 had passed through its revolving doors. The new arrivals would be washed, shaved, and deloused, and would spend up to a week at the hotel. Their personal effects were put in a bag and disinfected. They were measured, weighed, vaccinated, screened for infectious diseases, especially STDs, sexually transmitted diseases, and then checked for cases of TB or other respiratory problems. The estimated medium weight was around 95 pounds. The Lutetia was officially closed as a reparation center, repatri sorry, repatriation center on September 1st, 1945. And today it's a luxury hotel. During the war, the hotel reluctantly housed Nazis. After the war, it housed Jews who were recovering from their treatment at the hands of Nazis. And today it's owned by Jews from Tel Aviv. By September 1945, General Eisenhower discovered that most countries would not ex accept displaced persons. No matter what the goals were to rehabilitate those who had suffered so grievously during the war, these took second place to the more basic needs of food, water, shelter, and sanitation. Unlike the cooperation of many countries in Europe and elsewhere to to accommodate the refugees from Ukraine in 2022, the political issues in the 1940s were awful. 
Even after the war, when it came to providing protection and rehabilitative services to Jews, those protections were denied for years. Let's take a look at what happened after the war in more detail. In almost a foreshadowing of how the Russians are behaving towards refugees from Ukraine and those fleeing Russia itself as a reaction to the ag latest aggression, after the war, the Soviets tried to forcibly remove refugees from Western Union, from Western Europe, who had previously been residents of Soviet-controlled territory, to force them to go back to their homes. Our story begins in 1948. On June 25, 1948, President Harry S. Truman signed into law the Displaced Persons Act. The law was intended to be temporary. It went into effect in 1948, and it ended in 1952. This 1948 act followed several years of loosening quotas for people who had been displaced by the Nazis. Under a December 1945 directive, the first to loosen the quotas, over 41,000 displaced people left Europe for the US. Over 28,000 of them were Jews. On October 30th, 1948, the first ship carrying immigrants following the passage of the Displaced Persons Act landed in the US. The ship carried 813 passengers. These people were from all over displaced persons camps, all over Europe, wherever there was a displaced persons camp, you might find somebody on that ship who had been in one. And they were originally from 11 different countries. The 1948 Act allowed up to 400,000 displaced persons to immigrate to the US above quota restrictions. About 68,000 of them were Jewish DPs. Ships carry displaced persons and refugees to Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Western Europe, Mexico, South America, and South Africa. From March to August 1948, for example, over 5,100 Europeans arrived in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Rather than, con rather than continuing to speak right now in generalities or large numbers, I want to discuss a specific sailing of one of the ships that arrived in the US. The SS Marine Jumper, one of the McCormick Lines ships, made many sailings with immigrants who had been in the DP camps. One of these sailings, the one that left Hamburg on March 3rd, 1949 and landed in the US on March 12th, 1949, is notable for two reasons. First, unlike many US East Coast landings, it landed in Boston, not New York. Secondly, a small child, Ruth Ebner, and her parents were on the sailing. As an adult, Ruth would live all over the world, and after her retirement as a deputy city attorney for the city of Los Angeles, she relocated to Phoenix, where she remained until her death in 2016. Ruth and I became friends shortly before her move to Phoenix, and it was through that friendship that I began my research into the passengers on that specific sailing of the Marine jump, Jumper. Talking about large numbers of people, I think, makes the experiences difficult to understand. And although each family's and each person's experiences were unique, it's easier to tell and probably easier to understand when we focus on a family by name. I began my research in response to a comment Ruth made one day. She told me she knew she was born in Europe, but didn't know where. She thought she knew her birth date, but since her mother wouldn't say where Ruth was born, she wasn't sure if her birth date was correct. She knew the family arrived in the U.S. before her brother's 1950 birth in New York, but she had no idea when they arrived or how. I asked her if she wanted me to look into it, and she said she'd like that very much. So I began searching for Ruth's background. Of course, I started with what I knew. Ruth knew some of her relatives and about the lives of those who had survived and settled in the U.S., most of these were on her father's side, but she knew almost nothing about her mother's family. Like all of us, as she was growing up, she heard fragments 
of conversations between adults. From these fragments, she pieced something together that she felt had the basis of her family story, but she felt that she was missing the substance of who her family really was. Although Ruth wasn't adopted, her lack of knowledge of her family and her desire to know about them was similar to an adoptee searching for a birth family and that family's history. She said she felt like she had no background, no history, no place in the world. Ruth died in 2016, but this is the story we discovered. We began with Ruth's alleged birth date on August 10th, 1947 and the names of her parents and their death dates. Her father was Alexander Ebner, her mother was Helen Wolrach, and her mother died in 2004 in California. Her father died years earlier in 1988 in Chicago. Obviously, in order to find information, we need to identify people on documents and follow a paper trail. On lines 82 to 84 on this manifest, you can see Ruth, age 18 months, and her parents, Alexander and Helena. The manifest possibly doesn't look like other manifests you may have seen, but it's typical of one of the types of manifests for ships carrying displaced persons from Europe. You can see that in column seven, religion, is identified. Column six has nationalities. The three Ebners were Polish Jews and Alexander and Helena were born in Poland, which we see in column 11, but Ruth was born in Germany. In columns 13 and 14 are the name and address of their destination. Under the name Kempler Jacob, which is the Ebners de destination, are the letters H-I-A-S. This is the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, which assisted in this relocation. Other entries on the manifest have the initials of the agencies which assisted other passengers in their efforts to find a new home. NCWC is the National Catholic Welfare Conference. USNA is the United States Service for New Americans. Now, Ruth knew who the Kemplers were. One of her father's sisters married Jacob Kempler, and they, as we later discovered, had arrived in the U.S. in 1947, also survivors of the Shoah. Although the page of the manifest on the screen is from a digital database that I found on Ancestry, 11 or more years ago when I began my search for Ruth's family, these records were not accessible online. There were two places at the time that I could go to for information about victims and survivors of the Holocaust, the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum and Yad Vashem. Yad Vashem's in Jerusalem, the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum's in Washington, D.C. My search involved both of these resources. I got many documents from each of them. The first copy I received of this page was from Yad Vashem. They sent me a cover page for the manifest and a couple of other pages describing the number of immigrants on the ship and where they were from. I was curious and I asked for a copy of the full manifest, but at the time, all they were permitted to do by virtue of agreements with what was then the International Tracing Service at Bad Arrelson and is now called the Arrelson Archives was to send me by email a copy of the page or pages that only mentioned the specific people for whom I was searching. When I asked how to get the balance of the manifest, I was told I could acquire it, but to do so, I needed to come into Yad Vashem and get it myself. Well, I always welcome the possibility of a trip to Israel, but it's not always so convenient when I'm living somewhere in the US. So I asked a friend in Israel to get it and send it to me, which he did. At that time, there was nothing more than curiosity and a desire to have full records. But over the years, I grew to understand better why Yad Vashem couldn't send me directly what I wanted. 
The history of the Arrowson archives and agreements with the countries that administer it are very detailed. You can find more information about them on their website, and you'll have a link to that when Lisa um, sends it out later this week. This page was part of the file Yad Vashem sent me with the manifest. In the remarks field, it says nominal lists of DPs who emigrated to the USA on February 26th and March 3rd on board the SS Marine Flasher and Marine Jumper, name, first name, age, and destination in the USA as given. Okay, now I was thoroughly confused about what I was looking at, what I needed to be looking for, and where I needed to go find more information. The previous manifest was an outbound manifest. This is an inbound manifest, as it says on the top right. I searched endlessly for it. I first went online looking for the arrival of manifest and the vast databases of manifests at Ancestry. There were many other arrivals for the Marine Jumper and her sister ship, the Marine Flasher, but not the one that landed in March in Boston. I found newspaper articles about that landing, but I couldn't find the manifest. I went to the main branch of the New York Public Library and spoke with maritime experts there. I phoned government agencies searching for the hard copies or microfilm that contained the manifest and was told that the originals were all destroyed because of a lack of space, and it was likely that this manifest had not been microfilmed. To my shock, about six months later, I found it on Ancestry. That's a good lesson to learn. Repeating unsuccessful searches should be part of our exhaustive research because there's no telling when something for which we're searching is going to be added to a database or something new may be available that will resolve what we need or an index may be fixed. If you take a look on this in um, column four, you'll see the small amount of possessions a family was taking to their new home. The Ebners were taking one trunk, two handbags, a box, and a package. Now, that's not just for a casual trip or a vacation. These are all the possessions the family had. Let's trace the movements of the Ebners. On this card, we see something important. Not only does it confirm that the family was on the Marine Jumper, but it also tells us that they moved from one zone to another and they were at the Grone Transit Camp. Camp Grone was named after the area of Bremen in which it was built. Camp Grone was a military base of the US Army after the end of World War II. And it became the largest displaced persons camp, housing as many as 5,000 DPs prior to their immigrating to the United States or elsewhere. Camp Grone was in an area of a joint American-British sector in northern Germany called the Bremen Enclave, which included the ports of Bremen and Bremerhaven. Where did I get this? This is part of the Arrelson Archives' huge collection, billions of records, billions of pages of records. At the Grown Transit Camp, they might have been issued a card similar to this one by the IRO, the International Refugee Organization. This was issued to a passenger on one of those March sailings of the Marine Flasher. And in case you're wondering, all of the abbreviations and acronyms that I'm using are going to be on the handout, which are going to be sent as well as links to a number of the places that I mention, as well as a number of places that I don't mention, but which are valuable resources if you're doing research into this time period. The Ebners were all issued identity cards by the IRO. You'll notice that there's not only a description of the person in a photograph, but also fingerprints. The American Expeditionary Force, AEF, registered all people who were in displaced persons camps in the American sector with a card like this. 
On it, we find some amazing information about Helena's background, including her birth date and place and the names of her parents, including her mother's maiden name. And it also indicated where Helena's desired um, destination was in box number 12. She wanted to go to the US. It tells us also that she was a dressmaker. Tells us that her husband was Alexander and her daughter was Ruth. Ruth's card looked very similar to that of her mother's. To Ruth's delight, it had her birthplace. She hadn't known exactly where she was born, and now she knew that she was born in Wolfratshausen. Wolfratshausen, Germany, was the site of the Fernwald Displaced Persons Camp. This was in the American zone and was one of the largest DP camps. It was originally built in 1939 to house employees of IG Farben. IG Farben, you may recollect, was the company responsible for creating and producing the gas used in the gas chambers. When it became a displaced persons camp, Fernwald, whoops. Fern, when it became a displaced persons camp, Fernwald was an international camp, which in addition to Jewish DPs, also housed non-Jewish DPs from Poland, Yugoslavia, Hungary, and the Baltic states. It was changed to a strictly Jewish DP camp on October 3rd, 1945. You can imagine some of the fears among the Jewish inhabitants of that DP camp when confronted with non-Jews after the experiences they had just lived through. The birth rate was rapid in the camp, and within 15 months of its opening, approximately 200 women were pregnant at the same time. The camp became a self-contained ta town with very little outside contact. There was a school for children, a vocational training institute, and a yeshiva with 150 students. There were theatrical and musical activities and a weekly newspaper entitled Bamidbar, The Desert which became a medium of literary expression for camp inhabitants. Fernwald had a police force, a fire brigade, a youth home disciplinary commission, post office, and of course, a hospital. There was an extensive educational system as well as a court. The courts dealt with cases of violence between DPs, between DPs and Germans, and between DPs and Americans. To provide for the children, Fernwald organized summer camps and many sports with organized competitions. It was the final DP camp to close, functioning until 1957 as a home for Jews who had no place to go. Can you imagine so long after the end of the war, still having no place to go? It's frightening. Helena's parents, Ruth's grandparents, Abraham and Berta Woolrach, also survived the war. And in 1945, they settled in Fernwald too, although they wanted to go to what was then Palestine, as we see in box 12 of their 1946 AEF registration. They didn't leave until July 1949. And at that time, they went to the U.S., What's so important about this card? Now we know not only Ruth's grandparents' names, but also her great-grandparents' names. Isaac Fridla and Laia Weinreb. And we know where they were from. This is a residence certificate as well as proof of emigration and medical papers. The applicant, Alexander Ebner, Ruth's father, was born on April 3rd, 1909 in Bachnia, Poland, to husband and wife, Jacob and Hannah Ebner, nee Zolman. Alexander's permanent residence was in Wisniewski, Novi, Poland, from, 19, from August 1942 until the middle of 1943, he was in the Bachnia ghetto. 
He was liberated at the end of 1944 and after liberation resided in the DP camp in Frankfurt until 1949. In 1949, he emigrated from Bremerhaven to the US. All of this information was on this page. Among the documents the Ebners brought with them was their marriage record, which was translated in 1965. Why is it significant? For a family lacking roots and the kinds of documentation all of us have proving who we are, this had to be something extraordinarily precious to them. Ruth's birth record issued to her parents in 1962 when she was 15 was probably at their request. Ruth never saw this before our research brought it to light. Can you imagine reaching adulthood never knowing where you were born or even if your parents were telling you the truth of when? If you're adopted and in search of your parents and original birth record, you might have experienced the same feeling. Of course, these documents post-war all gave us clues to the family before the war. We know that Alexander Ebner, Ruth's father, was born in 1909 and was a fa farmer. His parents' names were Jacob Ebner and Hannah Zolman, and they were from Bachnia, now in Poland. At the time he was born, it was in Galicia, in the Austri Austrian Empire. We know that Helen's maiden name was Wolrach, and she was born in 1921, after World War I. Her parents' names were Abraham Wolrach and Berta Friedler, and they were from Benjen, Poland. Just like an adoptee, however, this possibly touches the tip of the iceberg and what's waiting below the surface is the desire to know more, to understand the history, to link yourself to a past. In other words, to stop being a displaced person. Ruth and I continued our journey to make that link for her and to fill in her own history. Berta Wolrach, Ruth's grandmother, filled out a social security application known as an SS-5 in the US. And although she didn't have her place of birth on it, she did have her parents' names, Isaac Friedler and Rachel Weinreb. I know Helena was from Benjen from her marriage record and using the Jewish Gen Communities database, I found out where it was located. Jewish Gen is an organization staffed primarily by, by volunteers that works to create indexes to records of Jews all over the world. First, I searched the JRI Poland database in the Piotrkov province in the Russian Empire for the surnames Friedler and Weinreb. JRI Poland has for over 30 years worked with the Polish archives to digitize and index records from all over Poland. To my pleasant surprise, there were six records, and I could see where the locations were on a map. Because I was looking in one province, the search results, I knew this, the results would be fairly confined geographically, but it turned out the results were more confined than I thought. They were all in one town. Those six records included the marriage of Ruth's great-grandparents, Isaac Fridler and Ruchla Leah Weinrib. Remember, we saw that Ruchla's that um, Leah Weinrib's name was Leah on one of the Holocaust records. And then we saw that it was Ruchla on the Social Security application. Now we know why. Ruchla Leah. With her great-great-grandparents' names and the births for her maternal grandparents, mother's siblings. Her maternal grandfather's place was a little more difficult to identify. His social security application gave a specific town, Tomaschel. But looking at the community's database again, I found there were two places with similar names. So close and yet so far. It's critical in order to successfully do Jewish research to identify a town exactly. Otherwise, you can't find the records. 
There's no countrywide database. And in fact, where this ancestral family lived, which is now Poland, was part of the Russian Empire until after World War I. Poland didn't exist. I took a guess that the town was more likely the place in the Piotrkov province since that was where the maternal family was from. Research is often begun based on hypotheses which we either prove or disprove. In this case, I needed to prove the Tomasho, where the Wolrach family was from, was in the Piotrkov province. In fact, I found the marriage of Ruth's maternal grandfather's family in that province, in a town called Rodomsko. It surprised me that, like Ruth's grandmother's family, I didn't find more information. So I searched for her grandfather, Elias Wolrach. This time, I found 14 records, and I decided to see if the family was in more than just Rodomsko. To my way of thinking, they must have been. Otherwise, there would have been more records there. There were records from three nearby places for several people with the same name. There was an Elias Mordko, who was born and died in 1844, and an Elias born in 1886, and Elias Karmajan, who married a Sura Wolrach in 1906, and a death record for an Elias Wolrach in 1904 in Tomashow. Since our Elias' son Abraham was born in 1891, it's clear he wasn't born in 1886, it's probable that based on his 1890 marriage record, that he was born around 1870. And when I looked for records for Hannah Tober Zandberg, Elias' wife, Abraham Walrach's mother, I found she was born in Radomsko in 1872. By the way, before World War I, it was called Novo Radomsk in the Novo Radomsk district in the Pyotrkov province in the Russian Empire. Research into this family, even after Ruth's death, is ongoing. Today's discussion focused on only a fraction of the research I did into this and other families and only touched on the vast numbers of different kinds of documents available through Ancestry's databases, Yad Vashem, the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, HIAS, the Joint Distribution Committee, and more. It would be impossible to cover all the types of research and documents I reviewed during this research. On the left is a picture of Helena in 1960. On the right is Ruth in 1965. I love doing research. It's as meaningful to me to do other people's research as it is doing my own. Holocaust research and restoring the memory of those lost or displaced is the most meaningful work I do. Thank you for joining me today. Not only is research into Ruth's family ongoing, but an odd coincidence made me decide that I wanted to find out similar information about all the Jewish families on that March sailing of the Marine Jumper. And so very slowly, I'm looking into what happened to the families after their arrival and what happened to them during the war. When I'm able to identify more information about the passengers, I also researched their ancestral families. This for me is a mitzvah project. No one asked me to do it. I've been in touch with many people whose families arrived on the March 3rd, 1949 sailing of the Marine Jumper. If any of you come across someone whose family was on that ship, please steer them my way. Oh, what was the odd coincidence? Well, a couple of years after discovering Ruth's family on the Marine Jumper, I was sitting next to a woman at a bar mitzvah reception. She told me she was born in a DP camp and arrived in the U.S. in 1949, and that she even knew the name of the ship on which she arrived. It turned out she, too, was on the Marine Jumper, and she was on that exact sailing. Please look for my new book, Stories They Never Told Me, told us coming out sometime in 2023. And again, thank you very much for joining me this evening. And thank you for allowing me the privilege of this presentation.
Great, thank you, uh, Janet. Uh, I guess we can go. To, we can start by looking at uh, the questions, if you could, in the Q and A. Yep, I'm just trying to um, to stop sharing my screen so I can see people. Okay, Hi. great. Uh, so, Q and A, you said. Okay. Yeah, Q and A, not the chat. Yes, big shop. Oh my goodness. So can you read the question? Yes, so the question from Eddie Zilber, it's not a question, it's a comment. Big shock for me to see the photo and hear the story of my Aliyah friend, Aliyah friend, Ruth Ebner. We were friends in Old Pan in Jerusalem in 1972-73. We lost touch. I'm sorry to hear she died so young. Wow. Thank you for sharing that, Eddie. Oh. Uh, next, uh, next is a question. Do I know which organizations are, rec are represented by SADI USNFA? I'm sorry, I don't know what that is. Oh, USFNA? Um, no, I, I don't. Uh, Laura wants to know, Laura's having an issue hearing back from the Arrelson Archives. Any suggestions? Well, Laura, I generally don't contact the Arrelson Archives directly, although you can. I usually ask for a search from the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum or from Yad Vashem. There are places on both of their websites that you can put in question, that you can put in requests for them to do a deeper search for you. They're very responsive, but they do have a huge backlog of requests, especially because both organizations were closed during COVID and only began opening up slowly uh, sometime in the last year. Um, they usually put requests from survivors first at the top of their list, and then they work then they work through their list, but I have very good success in hearing back from them. So I would like to pose a question uh, to you, uh, Janet, kind of trying to put the, the two presentations together. Mm. Uh, so the first question would be, if you were to summarize, I'm not talking about the mechanics or the technicalities, right. but if you were to summarize kind of the main things for Jews, why Jewish genealogy matter to us? And in what way does it matter? What, what would you say? Kind of what's the what's the significance of this kind of research? Well, I, I want to answer it in two ways. When we're all in school, as children, as we get older, whether it's elementary school, high school, college, post-grad schools, we're always learning about history. We learn about American history. We learn about European history. And we don't really learn about us. We know that we were floating around there someplace, but where do we belong? Where do we fit in? Um, many of us grow up thinking that we have no background that we're never gonna find anything out about our families prior to when they arrived in the US. And maybe we don't even know our family's original names. Obviously the names that we have are our names, but we have um, not quite an obsession, but bordering on it of a need to know, a need to know who we are, including what our names are what our names really are. Many of us have Hebrew or Yiddish names. We're named after deceased relatives. And maybe our family doesn't even know who those people were. Maybe our grandparents suggested the names because they were names they heard, but they didn't tell anybody. Um, what keeps me going, and I do this seven days a week pretty much. I'm on vacation this week. I'm still working. I'm still researching. Um, why? Because there's a limited amount of time in which we can really identify this. We can get the records now, but as we saw in Ukraine over the last year, we can't get to records that are not digitized and that are only accessible 
on site. Who else is going to destroy who we were? If that sounds paranoid, it's not meant to sound paranoid. It's meant to be realistic. Until the Soviet Union fell, we couldn't get to records in archives that were held by the Soviet Union. Those records only became available slowly by slowly after its fall. Can we find out who our families were before they arrived in the US? Yeah, I believe that we can. Not all the records are still there. Not all the records from all the towns are still there. But if we dig enough, we may be able to find that treasure, find out who we were, what our family's names were. Part of my family arrived in the US in the 1890s. My grandmother's maiden name was Miller. I used to say to her over and over again, what was your original name? She'd say Miller. She was born in the US. She was born with the name Miller. I was a kid. What did I know? I just kept asking. Finally, uh, when I was in my 40s and she was on her deathbed, she said two things to me. Miljanchik Vilyeka. I'm like, what? Well, you wanted to know where we were from and, and what the name was. <laughs> so I started looking at the at Vilyeka. And I started looking for Milyanchik's there, and I didn't find Milyanchik's there. She gave me the name of her father's family. That's where the Miller came from. But she gave me the town that her mother's family came from. Yeah, no, I, but here, here is kind of my question for Jewish historians, how do Jewish historians or sociologists, how do they use this kind of research or maybe not use this kind of research? So is it really something that is very kind of for experts only, people who really have the time to, to, to get into it? Uh, because most historians that I know, they don't do this kind of work. It's too, it's too detailed. It's too uh, granular. Yeah, it's very granular. And I, I feel my background was in sociology and anthropology, which led me to be digging into people's lives and who they were and how they lived those lives. And most historians deal with a macro. I'm dealing with a micro. I want to understand who they were. Where did they live? How did they live? And more than that, how did they fit in? to the larger society, what was that micro context in the macro? How did the macro affect them? And what role did they serve? Yeah. All right, we have some more questions, I think, in the Q&A. Uh, please repeat the title of your book, which uh, the title of my book will be uh, Stories They Never Told Us. And I'm hoping for sometime spring of 2023. And I will certainly let everybody I know know when it comes out and how to get it. Uh, how to find records of World War I German soldiers. Your grandfather served as a cook. I can't tell you that. Um, I don't know. Um, I don't know what the resources are for German soldiers during World War I. I wish I knew everything. Unfortunately, I don't. Uh, both your parents were from Hungary. They were sent, they were sent, uh, this is from Debbie Brown. Uh, they were sent as teens to various uncles that they had never met. They lost their families that remained in Europe. I grew up with that same sense of wanting to know about these missing families. Your description early in your presentation describes me exactly. Debbie, I'm really glad that, uh, that you could relate to what I was saying, and I'm sorry that you could relate to what I was saying. And I think that's too, yeah. I, it's it's too too bad we cannot really see the participants and really talk to them directly through the gallery. Uh, but it's kind of uh, 
if this were a regular class, for example, I, it would have been nice to have an interaction with the audience to kind of get a sense of, of uh, what it all kind of uh, means to us. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about other people who do this work in post-World War II, specifically as this lecture is about other genealogies or Jewish historians who are doing this kind of work? Oh, you know, people like Omar Bartok and Bartok, you, yeah. Yeah. And you probably know better better than I the long list of people who are researching Jewish lives. There Yaffa Eliach did that amazing, amazing uh work of hers recreating an entire town, Aisha Shock. Um and just in my in my dissertation, I probably had 30 pages of titles of books of people who were doing that kind of research. It's it's enormous. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, there's there are people all all over the world, all over Europe and Israel, the U.S., um, South America. South Africa, Australia, who are researching this because one of the, we know that there were so many people murdered. Yad Vashem has collected uh, pages of testimony on over 4 million of those 6 million who they are hoping to be able to document. There were more than 6 million Jews killed. There were Jews killed um, in the streets of their towns. Uh, the book Holocaust by Bullets by Father Patrick Debois, and I can't think of the name of the book that came after that, documents some of what happened in Europe through eyewitness accounts. And, uh, and, and he's got their accounts videotaped, recorded, and, um, and then transcribes pieces of the inter interviews with them along with his commentary. In, in Holocaust by Bullets. Um, there's Daniel Mendelssohn's book. Um, so, so many works that attack different type, different directions of what happened and recreating and restoring Jewish life. There's memoirs by people who survived the Shoah and all the Yisker books. And these books all detail the minutia of daily life in these places and how our ancestors all lived. Just absolutely amazing accounting. Mm -hmm. Okay, you've got some more questions in the Q&A. I was born in a DP camp in Austria. How can I get a copy of my birth certificate? Well, it might not be a, a birth certificate. It might just be a note in a ledger, or it might be a record in one of the um, on on a card such as I showed you that that's held at the Arrelson Archives. Uh, that's from Adela Weinstein. Um, put in an inquiry to both Yad Vashem and the U.S. Holocaust Museum and have them both work on getting any information that they have on your family. And the reason I say to search through both of them is although there's an overlap of records, there are also records that each of those repositories hold that, that are um, unique to those institutions. Eddie, In Broad Daylight, the name of a book. And um, Anna says there are quite a few wonderful genealogy groups on Facebook. Today's listeners may want to visit and join and ask questions and share infos. Uh, Tracing the Tribe and uh, the Jewish Genealogy Portal are two of the major Facebook groups that I know of that handle questions and have discussions. There's many, many others. There are Facebook groups for many countries for towns. Um, I belong to one that's for the town in Romania that my that my uh, grandfather was from. There are discussion groups. 
You're going to have to look for them, though. And so of course, there's the Jewish Gen Discussion Group. Mm -hmm. Is it fair to say that for you, the meaning of Jewish genealogy is all about what? Um, it's about perfect. restoring memory. Restoring memory. Okay. It's also, you know, as Jews, um, we, we go, grow up with a tradition of Ladur Vador from generation to generation and Kabed Avim honor your father and your mother. So doing this research is a way to honor my parents and my ancestors. It's also a way for me to transmit that knowledge to my children and grandchildren, nieces and nephews, so that the memory of those people who came before doesn't fade from active memory. We all have different, um, different concepts of what happens after death. I truly believe that we only live in people's memories mm -hmm. and the way to live after we've gone is by making sure that people know our names. Mm -hmm. There's um, one of the uh, photographs on uh, Yad Vashem and I can't remember. <sighs> I could kick myself. I cannot remember the name of this person. It under the photograph it says, "I would like for people to remember that once there lived a person named with his name," and it, it's so important. Before I started doing this research, people in my family did not know the name of my great grandmother, who, along with most of my grandmother's siblings. And my great grandmother's sister and most of her children were all murdered in the streets in what was Stanislav, Poland, um, on um, during uh, during Sukkot. And um, my research discovered their names. My sister named her next child after my great grandmother, whose name we had just discovered. Mm. We can't, we can't live in perpetuity if nobody knows who we were. All right. This is a powerful line to, to end unless we have other comments from the audience. But I don't think that I see new questions. Uh, so let me just remind all of you that on Sunday at six, Dr. Aaron Welt from Hunter College uh, will deliver the last uh, presentation for this year's um, Zoom events. And his topic is quite unusual and may some people may not like it entirely, but the focus, is, the title of the lecture is Strong Armed Organized Crime and the Jewish ethnic economy in New York. So it's really original research, very interesting, not so pretty and not so, uh, you know, uh, nice to think about Jewish uh, organized crime, but that's part of the immigrant story in the United States. We can't ignore it. And I think that people will find it uh, very, very interesting because it connects economic life, labor movement, immigration, uh, protection, Jews needed protection because the police didn't deliver it to them. So all this comes alive in his uh, dissertation. Sounds fascinating. He, uh, say it again? Sounds fascinating. Yeah, it is fascinating. It's absolutely a fascinating dissertation, very well written. So we're going to listen to him on six o'clock on Sunday, the 11th. Yeah, December 11th. And with this, I wish you all a good evening and hope to see at least some of you on Sunday and in future presentations and talks of Jewish studies. So good night and um, the best to you. And you can stay still here. Oh, somebody else had a, a, new, a new comment. Uh, you can go. A uh, couple there. of thank yous. Ah, thank yous. Okay, great. Wonderful. 
So yeah, this is a fascinating, fascinating topic. I just kind of think uh, because it's so micro, kind of on the micro level, historians don't have the time to deal to do that kind of stuff. It's you just know, possible. Well, and we every once in a while, I'll get um, an academic who applies for a job with us, and and I'll talk to them about what they do. They've got pretty much unlimited time to be able to go do their research and dig into all kinds of resources that are out there. And we're focused on very tiny little things. Yeah. And um, so so doing what I do is confusing, I think, um, and probably frustrating to to a lot of people who are used to dealing with much larger topics but i think that when we're looking at the micro we might be able to understand the macro better on on the level of social history for sure yeah, on on, for sure. on other levels i'm i'm not totally sure that it, no. it adds to other aspects of uh, history i mean it's it's important but i just uh it's a particular kind of specialization. That's kind yeah. of what it is. Uh, so it's, yeah. it's absolutely fascinating. <laughs> you know, I, I may be one of the very few people, years and years ago, there was a series on PBS on the, on the shtetl, I think. And it was mostly black and white. And it was, I don't know, 40 or 50 hours something huge and i recorded the whole thing on wow. videotape and i listened to the whole thing over and over and i got these pictures of houses in the shtetl and how people were dressing and what they were doing and then um a number of years ago at temple emmanuel in phoenix uh there was a presentation on the the wooden synagogues yeah in tempe temple yep. emmanuel, mm -hmm. tempe. yeah yeah and um, and that rounded that out a little bit more. And you find out about aspects of people's lives. We think of wooden buildings that look perhaps slightly flimsy as something that's of lesser construction. But those, uh, those wooden synagogues were very much a highlight of Jewish, of Polish Jewish life. Years and years ago, in the back in the 60s, when I was in Israel for the first time, um, there's, uh, there's a memorial, a Holocaust memorial, that has the names of the towns where Jews were murdered on the walls, on the ceiling. Every place you turn is a name of another town. I went there as a teenager. And I think that that trip, when I went to Yad Vashem and I went into this memorial place, I didn't know very much about the Shoah at that point. Oh, you really? know, yeah, um, except that my next door neighbors had numbers on their arms. There were kids in school with me who had who were born in displaced persons camps who went from there to England and then slowly made their way over to the US. So I knew bits and pieces. I knew people. But it but you know, just like if you see somebody with a physical disability, you don't ask what's the matter, you know, what was your experience? How did this happen? The same way you didn't just go over to somebody with numbers on their arm and go, what's that? Mm -hmm. So the so the questions were kind of hidden, laying dormant, go into Yad Vashem back in, it was probably open 10 years, 15 years when I was there the first time. And you start finding out some of the more nitty gritty of, of what went on. And this, this research that I do, a lot of it, not all of it, of course, into the Shoah, but a lot of it um, is built on that early, on that early background. When, um, 
I guess it was sometime in the 1990s. So we're talking about still pre-digital. And I was at Yad Vashem and I was looking through reels of microfilm and pages of microfish. Remember those old machines? I, I sure remember that. I'm yeah. sure you do. I found the record of my grandfather's brother at Matthausen. Oh, uh-huh. And my grandfather had never told us which camp his brother was in. In fact, my grandfather told a different story. He said that his brother was shot trying to rescue his daughter, that he, that he developed a relationship with one of the guards, and he was supposed to be bribing him uh, to get his daughter out. And he went back at the appointed time and with the money, and he was killed. Well, I don't know where my grandfather heard that mm. story from. And his brother probably was shot, perhaps trying to escape, but he was definitely in the camp. Mm. Have the intake pages. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that was the first record that I ever found from the Shoah that I could, that I could relate to. You know, a lot of us grow up um, with mm. the diary of Anne Frank. That's the first time that you really hear of something that's not a number, six million. Yeah. Um, and, and finding the information out about the individuals becomes really important in order to be able to absorb the larger scale. Yeah. It is kind of mind-boggling, actually. You can never really capture the, <laughs> the full scale of, of this trauma. But no. it's, uh, it's, it's really fascinating, yeah. Um, well, thank you so much for sharing thank your you. knowledge and your expertise. And uh, Thank you for having me again. Um, yes, I look Bobby. forward to seeing you soon. <laughs> Yes, we will meet soon and uh, enjoy your time in South Carolina. Thank you. Thanks. Sure. Um, and I hope that at some point um, I'm able to do something in person and perhaps also perhaps have it hybrid where we've got some virtual community as well as as something in person. In person. Yeah. Yeah. We are definitely, definitely able to do that. All okay. right. Good Thank evening, you, Chava. everybody. Thank you.